So today is uh, September 5th, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi. And uh, there's no set agenda today. It looks like um, we'll leave it as an open discussion. Anyone have any questions you'd like to pose or anything we need to discuss? Should we just do a roundup on who, um, all the people we're trying to contact? St starting with like Jeff Howell and stuff. We just were waiting for a response from um, from Spencer. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, I've been trying to get a response from Spencer. He he said he was going to meet with Jeff Wednesday, but he asked if we had a budget, but we, I said, uh, yeah, through your advice here that we don't have a budget yet and that we're still kind of trying to get a grasp of the situation, but it did seem like he, he wanted things already planned out. He wanted us to have a budget. So, um, I mean, my, my thought was that, um, I thought, I thought he was, I mean, I, it'd be nice to have him on board with the idea. And then we'll, you know, the budget and that other, you know, the logistics will come later. But uh, I don't know what, what's your thought on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. It's funny how, it's like I was saying. You know, you, you wave a dollar and <laughs> they'll drop their pants for anybody. It's like the, you know. They still don't get it. I think that it's it's like uh, you know it's for the planet. <laughs> it's a social movement. It's it's not a gig, but uh, yeah, we'll hopefully get there gradually. But wow, it's it's incredible how all these artistic types also then principled and stand on their high horse, and then you know you just you know wave a dollar around and <laughs> all the principles are gone. They'll do anything for a dollar. They'll sacrifice any principle for a dollar. But uh, yeah, we just have to carry on working. Eventually, I think they will. They will get it. But uh, I hope we lose them. Just, just you know, because they like. Hey, no, we're not political. <laughs> so it's like, well, destruction of the planet's not political. It's existential. So, but it's really funny, isn't it, how people are so out to lunch on this issue? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's the disconnect. Uh, Sophie and I talked about um, this Dave Wigginton. He, he's um, the, the post on Reddit, how he's watching on geoengineering, and he made a great video about how it's uh, destroying the trees where he's at in Northern California. And they're already just, I mean, if no one, if you don't know already, they're already starting this geoengineering 
projects, even without a public eye. And yeah, I'm, I'm closely, you know, I, I just recently found that, you know, I'm glad that poster posted on Reddit because I'm going to follow his, what he's doing and definitely good stuff there. Yeah. And he also has a documentary on climate um, engineering that um, I'll plan to watch later. But um, like I was saying, they're just, uh, I don't know if these artist types are just the way, are, uh, they're just, they just don't understand the situation. I, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, please. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think that is achievable for social movement or something like Extinction Rebellion is to try and oppose terror just to resist because the way things are going you know as crisis comes traditionally people go totalitarian and so you know all these artist types and gay people and LGBTQ you know community and stuff is those those are the guys that get the chop with from totalitarians so it's it's funny that you know they have a lot at stake, but they have zero interest in, in caring about, you know, the future. Even though it seems pretty obvious to me what's what's coming, they, they just don't see it. Not at all. They're still doing the, the you know, you're on the wrong side of history. If you <laughs> So it's like, no. <laughs> history shows that, it, you know, the left wing liberal thing is on the wrong side of history because things things are going to go south and when things go south they they go fash <laughs> right wing fascist or some kind of state totalitarianism and tyranny so yeah i hope people stop with this nonsense about the right side of history is they anybody on the left left wing liberal or any fringe group they're on the wrong side of history I mean, unless you think it's all going to be sweetness and light and it's all going to be liberal democracy and everybody's going to have plenty and there's going to be social justice. But I think it's obvious that we're heading in the opposite direction. So strange. But what we were saying before you arrived, um, Hugh, with Mike, is that there's a terrible um, a percentage of, of people in, in XR who are um, not in contact with nature, who are urban and who are not only urban even probably the ones that live in the country too they they have a disconnection that is so obvious in when how, the way they talk about it they have no they, it seems like a lot of them i'm not i don't want to generalize i'm sure there's people who have hands-on and connections and stuff like that but in general the feeling you get out of that sub is that it's it's something abstract nature something outside of them that's it's just all oh, we protect a few trees and the poor animals and we'll be vegan and and we'll support sea shepherds and all that shite but you know when you hear that guy talking there in that video like i couldn't put on the camera because i've been crying about these trees you know it's just i don't know have you ever anybody in the yeah, group I saw have you one been by a catastrophe around you have you seen a Animal plants destroy where you live. Where you have you seen the effect of of climate change on the water where you live? Have you have you felt it in your body? Have you felt this this thing that's happening around you physically? Because this is this is part of us. This is not a, a, an, arti a, an an artificial thing that you read in articles and that you you just you know look at charts and measure and components and chemicals and everything like that. It's something that you feel. You know, and those, that's, and that I never see that in the people in extinction oh. area. Never, never. Well, that's why I don't think it's too reductionist to talk about the five led brain. Because these people are, they live in the alien cortex and they're intellectualizing all of the ecological collapse. They have no connection with nature. Because it's the lower four layers that have a connection with with nature, and so what you're talking about is that feeling is is the other four layers are feelings based. The alien cortex doesn't really feel, and so it's like Naomi Klein says, it's like you know the polar bears don't do it for me. And what she's saying is, I live inside my front brain, my my frontal lobes, the alien cortex, 
And so she's saying, you know, I don't have a, you know, maternal instinct towards polar bears. So, you know, that's not climate change for me. And so the, the urban people are living inside the alien cortex. So you can't expect them to hop out of that and suddenly start feeling. It's, it's as I say, you've got to start from a, a cultish movement. You've basically got to drag them into an egregore and change the culture within the egregore. So you, you can't fence with the alien cortex. That's, that's what everybody, and me too, in the, on Reddit is doing, is fencing with people's alien cortex. But I'm, I'm just trying to wear them out to exhaustion so that you can try, you know, basically do culture change. But yeah, you can't rationalize your way out of climate change and you can't get people to feel the destruction of nature. So both of those avenues are closed. But it really destroys people that are, are like us and close to nature because it's tearing our heart out to see this. And these people have zero emotion. They literally numb. So they, they numb to the damage they're causing. And you can't reach them at the intellect because they'll just play chess and fence with you till the cows come home. So you have to circumvent b both problems. And that's that's why I say you've got to start a, a thing and do something like an ARG to drag them into the game. And then when, once they once they have loyalty, you know, primate brain loyalty to a group, then they start to adopt the mores of the group. And so you can impose any mores you like. So they even know Naomi Klein, if she's in a group that has as part of the egregore that we care about the polar bears, then she will act like she cares. <laughs> but you, you're never going to get to her while you say, you know, you must care, you must care. Look at these statistics. Look, everybody does statistics. And it's like, if any, if, and that's just appeal to the rational side, your alien cortex. But your alien cortex doesn't give a continental shit about nature. <laughs> it's actually alarmed about nature and control. So you, you, you're saying like, oh, you must give up control. You're saying like, fuck you. <laughs> I'll give up my control over my dead body is what the alien cortex is saying and what Naomi Klein is saying in all her books. So, but that is the final, the final end game is the battle between the alien cortex and our traditional brain, our, our ancestral brain. That's why it comes down to transhumanists, i.e people dominated by the intellect and alien cortex and by people that have feeling and the mammalian brain in particular. But that's, that's, that's the end game. That's the final battle that humans are going to have is the battle, the internal battle between the head and the heart. I wonder how many people in, in XRA to die to defend the to defend uh, an ecosystem, to defend the sea. To, I wonder if they're ready to to put their life, like like the the the, the monkey wrench gang or people who who went really, you know. I mean, the monkey wrench gang is a novel, but I mean, you know, that sort of like the like of, of Max Gil, um, um the the like the likes of DGR people who really put their their physical welfare on the line to to defend a. a a forest or a, or, or a mountain, you know, I, I don't know. Does that exist still? Is there people who are ready to physically put their life on the line for that? I don't think yes. there is. Yes, but the indigenous people, yeah, the millions, the billions, but the indigenous people, they, they don't come on Reddit <laughs> in YouTube. So, so everybody online is intellectual, they're urbanized. And they have zero connection with nature. They're basically a write-off. But in XR, you know, XR is essentially a woman's organization. And uh, it's a woman's movement. And it's dominated by the mammalian brain. So most of the people say things like, we're doing this for the children. We're doing it for your children. You know, please, we love you. We're doing this for your children. It's all mammalian brain stuff about the children. So basically, they women with eco anxiety, and that eco anxiety is expressed in their mammalian brain, and it comes out as protect the children. And so, you know, you can make a little headway uh, by saying, you know, okay, well, it's all the evil one percenters, because what you're saying is that's the reptilian brain. 
there's all these you know billionaire types a reptilian brain so the reptiles coming for your children <laughs> Miss, mrs mammal and so you can get a bit of headway out of that but it, the, the primary psychology is a mammalian brain with a thin slice of alien cortex uh, defending it intellectually and if, if you look on reddit it, on the extinction of stuff all the stuff i write you can you can usually see whether the person's male or female and you can clearly see the arguments that the woman come up with they kind of half formed half baked half rationalized thing it's just the alien cortex confabulating and working over time on behalf of the mammalian brain and the mammalian brain is screaming protect the children and so you know that's the the egregore you work in you work working again but yeah i mean uh we have to get back to basics and we have to get back to some of the things that have been forbidden in our culture and one of them is division of labor and this idea that you know there's no such thing as gender we, we need to get over that because even in a movement xr you'd be yeah you know, you'd be better off making a woman's and a men's movement but combining the two you get all these mixed messages and that's all a big mess so but i, I just put something on xr there did you see that post that I just put, which is the, the first thing I did as a post-mortem post to the rebellion. And, um, you know, please go over there and brigade it a bit. But yeah. you'll, you'll see how the, the answers and responses you get will be they're very, very predictable. Um, and so you could you could help my stress levels if, if you actually went and, you know, answered, gave the obvious answers um, to, to people for the obvious questions. But well, the, there's a big danger, and the big danger is half half the organization, because they left brain, they they want control of the climate crisis. So the danger of, if it's a women's organization coming from the mammalian brain, they, their instinct is control, because they the mammalian brain is thinking, I need control of this rampant lizard brain. I need control of the reptilian brain and all these impulses that are going to you know, destroy the nest and hurt the babies. And so they will go for geoengineering because their thinking is, will that get control of the situation? Yes, do it. <laughs> you say, well, it's going to kill all your babies. It's like, but you know, when? Some abstract time, and there's, you know, you'll you won't convince them that geoengineering is a terrible idea for the babies because they're just like immediate stress, immediate relief, geoengineering, do it. So there's a there's a real battle ahead. To, to sort out, you know, the transhumanists against the tree aggers or the but this rocket is not, men against the... Uh, yeah, but this is not what I hear from a real, real white mothers and white women that I know. They're not like that. They don't think that way. They don't think that way at all. They don't think in terms of... Like yeah, but you, you see, you're closer to indigenous people. Yeah. Wild, yeah. But, but you're closer to indigenous people. I'm talking about people that live yeah. in New York and London. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But if you talk, if you talk to somebody in Africa or India, I think yeah. that they will echo what you're saying. Yes, that lady in India who's fighting for the seeds. What's her name? Um, she, um, you know that um, woman. I, I tried to contact her actually. Vandana Shiva. Yeah. Vandana Shiva. She she's she's an extremely Vandana Shiva. Oh oh. Right. She is extremely yeah. uh, like that. She she she's got a, she's got that real wild woman um strong streak and she's a fighter she's a real fighter yeah yeah for, for most indigenous women i think that the big evil bogeyman is white man <laughs> because the colonialism and oppression and all the stuff that they've lost like land and water and rights to everything uh and the you know, environmental destruction, it's done by white hunters and white men, white policemen and stuff like that. So, oh yeah, I saw a very funny thing from like Trevor Noah. So, you yeah, know, Trevor Noah is kind of, he has a, he had a, a German father or something, but a white guy. And uh, that guy didn't hang around, so he was brought up by his grandmother. and. When Trevor Noah recently went back to South Africa, he took a camera crew with him, 
and you know the camera crew were white guys and his grandmother was was kind of shocked she said like, <laughs> you know that he, he was bringing white guys into the house because she said you know like forgive me for being a little bit <laughs> stressed out but said you know white men to me are like police during apartheid <laughs> so i'm not used to white men coming into my house except to like hold me off in the night so yeah i think that's true in in a lot of the world you know that still still remembers white colonialism it, it had a white man's face on it <laughs> Yeah, but it, it doesn't mm. really matter because it it always it comes back to what you said earlier, uh, the alien cortex and and you know whatever it, whether an indigenous people, white people, whatever you'll have you'll have them everywhere. Like I've been in in places with indigenous people fighting against other ones because of their, their not because of their um, because of a pipeline, for example. I I was on a thing years ago and and you could see nearly. 60% of the indigenous people couldn't see any problem in having their fields and their sea and everything destroyed by by shell and you know and getting a bit of money out of it and some and some jobs they hadn't any and the other one they were all from the same culture they were all coming from the same backgrounds but you know the divide is it doesn't matter i mean the right race color it doesn't doesn't matter at all that's that's just caricature mm -hmm. it's it's total caricature mm -hmm. i'm sure in south africa in the zulu people you have loads of people who won't be happy to to put the, the you know the, the the control and the and the logic on everything too like that they're not you know it's it's that divide is is ridiculous really colonialism well, the, the, yeah the, it, the same happens in the US as happens all through Africa. And what, say, like Big World does, it divides the people and it simply just promises them money. And they bought off very cheap. So, you know, like the Native Americans and stuff for pipeline. They, you know, the big, big oil can, will split the population in two because they just say, like, oh, we will pay everybody all four grand. And then half the people would say, look, you can't give up our land for four grand and other people say well maybe you can't but they're going to do it anyway i'll take the four grand and so they drive a wedge through the population and they've always done that that's just standard tactics in africa too they just um either buy off the headman or split the population but the the weird thing is they can be bought off for so cheap because they can just promise you know they, they can just promise hey we'll give you 10 grand if you let us put the pipeline through and like the 10 grand never comes they never even have to pay it out even though it's chicken feed they don't pay it so then you know then the population is aggrieved and everything but as soon as they start monkey wrenching the pipeline then the government comes in you know removes them off the land or you know they they, they can get the government to do their dirty work for them afterwards because they they get rebellious and want what the money won the stuff they were promised and then the, then it's the government's problem it's not the pipeline owner's problem that's that game has been played all over the world and played every day and tell me where we we, we but, went on yeah, the, it's played with us we we started to talk about all this but we were talking mike with mike had started about spencer spencer and jeff holland and we were going to do a roundup of the people we wanted to get in so maybe we could go back because i don't know has there been any progress on on the arc creators and or well, not arc sly ops or whatever we call it now um <laughs> because that would be that's important you know yes so we're just waiting to hear yeah. back from spencer has, has anybody Still. made any progress on any of it and uh i'm still looking for others it's tough but um yeah trying to see who in meow wolf would be a good uh candidate but uh it's been tough or any artists trying to see who I can uh, who yeah who's a good candidate for sure well, in bright axiom the artistic director oh um yeah I'll, I'll check I contacted the other from Jijun Sarah but I haven't heard back from her yet but uh, I think there is someone from Bright Axiom that I can, yeah, I can contact her, her as well. Yeah, I've been waiting on my side. I've just been waiting for those two weeks to end. So now that 
this has ended, hopefully we can start progressing things a bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I did a project plan and stuff and I, I sent it off. I don't know if they, they've actually looked at it. They haven't really discussed it. But yeah, it's, um, I just assumed it'd be slow until the end of these rebellion weeks and then we'll see. What happened to Darren? Darren, I, I, you know, uh, did you read? I mean, I don't know if everybody on the meeting. I, I tried to do a group mail, so I sent his reply because he somebody posted the, the, the link uh, on on the sub. I mean, the post on the the sub that you wrote, Hugh, about him, and <laughs> it was a few. <laughs> there was a few words that were kind of <laughs> energetic. Uh, so um, he, he, he didn't seem to be too offended. So I <laughs> I replied to him and just did what we said, um, asking him to uh, what Mike suggested to be more precise about his particular projects, uh, movie, books, uh, documentary, and uh, to tell us what was the most important one for him and how and um, and that we would be really behind him if he wanted us to. To support him and to get his work his work out there, and um, I explained to him in the email that um, it was not a video game. I tried to give a little bit short definition, and and uh, that XR uh, the XR thing was more um, <laughs> a movement hacking than you know following, and that uh, you know, and I'm waiting. I, I just sent it yesterday or the day before when i got his reply because i only got his reply uh, two days ago and you you must have most of them most of you must have seen it he he was a little bit um but he, he seemed to have left the door open for me because he told me oh i like you and all that so i said okay I, if he likes me well i'll continue to stay in touch with him and we'll see if you know i think you were right the gender thing can work when you're trying to to to, to get somebody to you know to work with us that's why I'm sorry Petra is not there because she's going to be trying with Alison. And um, uh, I don't know where she is, but she's done a lot of work of studying her videos and listening to her, reading her stuff and her blog. So um, she'd probably get back to us one way or another. Actually, we might maybe organize a meeting in the week at a maybe at a better time for her because she's in the it's in the morning for her because where she lives, it's. Um, but uh, for, for Darren, I'm waiting. Um, I'll certainly uh, post or email anything that comes in when it arrives. <laughs> Should we have a meeting with anybody in particular? Is there anybody else that we look good? I have, no reply, from Paul, I, I have no reply from Paul Kings North and mm -hmm. um, Mark Boyle, but Mark Boyle, it takes a while with the post. And um, I think Paul is uh, busy at the moment promoting his last book, Alexandria. So he's, yeah, I think he's quite busy and he doesn't do much email. I think he checks his email quite rarely. He does He's not. So I'm allowing for that. So that's all for the moment. I haven't uh, contact um, personally. I haven't contacted anyone else at the moment. I think that I can remember. Yes, I got a reply from the Tompkins Foundation. Uh, the, the people who used to own the Patagonia company, who have got this enormous rewilding project in uh, Argentina, who have brought an, bought an enormous territory there, and you showed, uh, you posted a video on. Um, on geoengineering on uh, Reddit about a month ago, and she was interviewed, uh, what's her name, Christina, I think. She was interviewed at the end, so I thought she had a position that was similar to ours. So I sent an email to her website and to her people, but they replied that she was far too busy to to, to have time for her. So I don't know if you have any suggestions to get, but it seems like that's a big corporation, that's a big thing. So I don't know, would they be interested with a little group like us? But I might send another one. I don't know. Yeah, I think she was in um, either Planet of the Humans or Bright Green Lies as well. I think. But yeah, pa Patagonia is a huge, a huge company. She, she's a multi-billionaire. She, she inherited all the money, I think. But that's her passion project in, in Patagonia. <laughs> Funnily enough, which was nothing to do with the company. 
Yeah, but she has completely abandoned that now. But she's she's very she's a very strong stance on geoengineering. That's why I wanted to to see if we could. So maybe she would doesn't she wouldn't like to be on an interview. But maybe we could try to stay in contact and try to get messages through. To, I don't know. I was thinking in terms of funding, a game. I don't know. How, and I have absolutely I haven't a clue about how to talk to business people. Oh, so I would be the worst want to do that so most of these most of the people have foundations and things like that that they work through and then those actually have contacts and pr people so you just go through the official channels and they'll give you the run around <laughs> but it, it might be possible to speak to somebody in the foundation or, you know, she, anybody that's that rich who has some issue like geoengineering they, they they normally do it you know in a father one through c corporation or something like that and so it has you know contact information maybe that that could be an interesting way of of, of uh recontacting uh, the, the organization asking asking what sort of action are they taking against geoengineering because of their stance and see a little bit where where they're going kind of thing you know because they might have some, I don't know. Might, they might be doing some big project that we don't know about. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah there's, there's broad resistance against geoengineering, and there, there, there are various um, initiatives to actually do like geo, uh, you know, geoengineering watch. So I posted one thing with this. A, a chart of these guys that keep track of uh, geoengineering projects around the world and they're just hundreds and hundreds of them but if you actually they keep a database of you know what happens to them and, and most of them get thwarted by indigenous populations so uh, this dr. Leslie Fields one where she did you know this ice 911 or it's it's now She's got kind of uh, thwarted, I think, by indigenous uh, objections to actually deploying these glass micro spherules in, in the Arctic. I mean, it's it's a breathtakingly stupid idea. It's, but it's an interesting idea from the, I mean, it's interesting project from the point of view of just how stupid these geoengineers are. So, I mean, um, I think uh, Torstein's actually on this call, but the, uh, but Torstein said that the the um, you know the whole idea of sprinkling a cover on the Arctic ice is is misfounded because the ice is actually being melted from the warming sea and the currents and the storm changing weather, so it's it's not sunlight that's melting the ice. So you know here she is spending years on this project raising money, and she she doesn't even know the basics like the fact that it's not it's not sunlight that's melting the ice and so you know it's that level of stupidity but but on one uh youtube video i did a comment and i said do you know that basically for every one ton of glass manufactured it emits two tons of co2 and she didn't know she responded to me she said oh i didn't know I said, how do you know that and i said well that's something to do with the glass industry but I went back and had a look and said to just check on my figures and see what the latest thing was. It was 3.04 tons of CO2 emitted per ton. So I just cannot see how, you know, changing the albedo of the ice 30% uh, warrants, you know, four tons per like something like square meter of CO2. It's just you're, you're completely working against yourself. But she was too dumb to know that. She said, well, I just got glass microspherials because it's a, a commodity product that you can buy on the commercial market. She never actually thought that to use the huge and huge amounts that you'd actually need to geoengineer the Arctic ice would, you know, would completely transform the glass industry and in massively increase demand for glass microspherials. And in all her papers and it's never accounted for the fact that, that that would emit three tons of co2 which would completely nullify the whole project and and that in general is how stupid these scientists are that nobody i mean particularly people in in xr they kind of worship scientists and they will 
kind of goody two shoes liberals that came out of the academic system and you know got some psych degree or something and they all think that you know scientists are um, high priests and they don't know how breathtakingly stupid scientists are so it's it's worthwhile just contacting some of these groups and interviewing these people just so you can make them look stupid and show people just how misplaced their faith in these scientists is and and would be and the other thing i mean there's so much on just it there's a enough of a project alone on geoengineering so it would be really good to try and expose these guys because that paper that i i said about uh, you know this is a very bad idea but the uh, big bad fix i think was was the it's a book but it was pdf form uh, i put links to it. that really lays it all out and that day um you know ken caldera and david keith they they're one of a, a group of about 20 guys it's just a little handful just a little coterie of guys that have steered the the world towards you know geoengineering and so i think they're very easily exposed and and you know if if Extinction Rebellion did one thing this year, it it should be because those guys. It's it's not like the oil industry and stuff. It's it's a, a group of special interests, and they need funding and stuff. And it's very feasible to have a popular public discourse that that basically nullifies that. But but you see. It, it's worthwhile just pursuing it just to get more exposure. I mean, that is something you do want to raise awareness. Raising awareness about climate change is like you know, selling ice to Eskimos. It's just stupid. But the, the you know geoengineering nobody knows about, and geoengineering is very odious and it's it's very secretive. And if it's exposed, it it, it you know the opposition to it could be well, well worth stopping because. There's not money in it. There's not money in it like big oil, or big agro or something. So you just have these scientists that are trying to push an agenda with, backed by people like Bill Gates and stuff. But those, the funding would dry up as soon as it became publicly untenable. But um, so I, I would say, uh, yeah, it's, it's well worth pursuing. Yeah, but the Chinese, the Chinese are using geoengineering and probably the Russians too, but the Chinese are using it for a long time now. And there's very. I did a bit of research, and it's hardly well, impossible to find. Like the, the, it's a bit. I've seen some yeah. Indian articles, but it's it, they are. They have. You say there's a little group of people in the West. Okay, fine. Like those guys, those those clueless guys. But there's in China. There's a big, big group of people who are doing it for the last few years. And I wonder what are the connections between the West and China on this on this issue of geoengineering, because I, I, sometimes I get a little bit paranoid. But I think that there must be some kind. Look, look at the the bioweapon research in Wuhan. Like that was most, that was internationally funded. That lab. It was not just a Chinese project. So these these crazy guys, they're probably working hands in hands with the Chinese on all these things. I don't know. I'm just. Imagine. Maybe, but you, um, so it, it's complicated. But yeah, the, most militaries do some research in, into weather modification. So, whether you see, they make a distinction between weather modification and geoengineering because geoengineering is climate modification. And what they claim is that, you know, weather modification that is just basically seeding clouds to make them rain and stuff like that is they say, well, that's doesn't have any impact on the climate well uh, it does if you do it enough you know basically the the weather engineering they did in vietnam to try and you know make the ho chi minh trail muddy and stuff like that that was that that was extending the monsoon and extending the monsoon is changing the climate so it's it's subtle um so but uh yeah the it's it's primarily a military technology and the military has been using it for a long time but it it helps to raise awareness because there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of conspiracy theories are wrong. So the, the, all the stuff about harp and stuff like that that's all bogus conspiracy theories. Um, and the the contrails and confusion with chemtrails and stuff is that's also bogus conspiracy theory. 
And it's very likely to be deliberate misinformation put out by the military to discredit anybody that says anything about geoengineering. So they, that's often a PSYOPs technique is, is you dis discredit anybody that says anything about geoengineering because you rubbish them as crackpot conspiracy theorists and, you know, anything about geoengineering, you call, you know, conspiracy theorists that believe in harp and then you write a little article say why geo you know anti geoengineering people are wrong and then you say well they're all conspiracy theorists that think you know the US military is changing the climate from harp and changing the ionosphere and then you know but that's not true and it's basically it's raising these straw men and then shooting them down to make anti geoengineers look ridiculous and it works very well but you can do it the other way around too. Right? So the the it, it also means that people that are pro geoengineering, you can also make them look like crackpots and discredit them and do character assassinations. And I think that's that's the way to go. But it it's it's a terribly difficult and thorny thing. You know, you have people like um, uh, you know Peter Wadhams and stuff. He actually likes the idea of um, marine cloud brightening. And so does Paul Beckwith. <laughs> a lot of these guys, they, they, you even know, Jim Bendel, you know, even I mean, Jim Bendel, like what, you know, even Jim Bendel. And, yeah. and I mentioned Faulty said in passing that, you know, he said like, well, we might need that eventually. And it's like, no, we need geoengineering like, like a hole in the head. When we've started geoengineering. You can assume we've just underlined our fate and we, we're going extinct. The moment we start mass geoengineering to modify the climate. You can take it as red. We, we, it's a matter of time before humanity is wiped out. Not not just humanity. It's basically we might turn this planet into Venus. But the, the, you see, but it's it's very fraught because a, a lot of geoengineering is is land modification and land use modification. So so in in essence, even what that woman is doing in Patagonia can be characterized as geoengineering. So restoration efforts are also geoengineering. And, and uh, a lot of geoengineering now flies under the banner of landscape management, but it is clearly landscape management with the aim of changing climate. But even reforestation can be considered, um, and uh, yeah, uh, forest restoration is is also often a code name for geoengineering. So, but the, the but when I say geoengineering, I really meant the really cheap and and dangerous kind and the primary you know really really bad one is solar radi radiation management so that's scopex and, and sulfates in the upper atmosphere that's the really bad one the next really bad one after that is, is marine cloud brightening but you know so putting um silver iodide up in the atmosphere to uh to make rain and stuff is what the chinese are doing in, in tibet on a massive scale but it's it's just um, to make rain in southern China at the expense of drought in northern China, and and then they do it routinely. They did it for the Olympic Games and for any official event. The the PLA actually launches silver iodide and rockets and things to to rain out the clouds so that you know it's dry when the event happens. But yeah, the the military is going to use it, and so you can take it as red that if we go to war these days an uh, important part of the war would be um, climate war it would be climate warfare and you know that this is coming because you can see it in NOAA the and uh, in NOAA and all these kind of weather things which essentially are civilian they're having millions now of top secret um, clearances so top secret security clearances and it's like for weather prediction and stuff for them to have top se um, security clearances there are a few things you need for like launching satellites and rockets and stuff but generally you know that it's it's some nefarious climate modification thing but yeah one of the dangers of going to war is that they certainly you know they they if it goes thermonuclear, they will moderate thermonuclear war with climate change in mind. So climate, 
so climate modeling and stuff is it, a lot of it is done for nuclear winter scenarios in, in, in a nuclear war which which is the scariest one of the lot because it, it implies that the guys at the that will think hey no we can take it up to any temperature we like we'll cool it down by nuking china that's as scary as geoengineering gets but, yeah but it's the, the whole mindset needs to be undermined under the much broader rubric of this control idea there's basically this alien cortex and this hubris of control of everything um, down to the weather it's like humans can't control the weather you're just nutty you know, Beckwith is crazy <laughs> he's just crazy ass. So, so what would be interesting is that if we want to discredit completely those techniques that you've described, like a marine cloud brightening and uh, and solar radiation modification, we should maybe d find a bit more information and simplified information about these two techniques and show how they are absurd. And maybe that would be more interesting than just using the term geoengineering, as you said, because I remember a couple of weeks ago, um, our friend Divine Beast, he was saying that Geoengineering has started since agriculture has started, and he's totally right. You know, um, so yes, we we that's the two techniques I think we should bombard um, people with and saying, look what happens, and and you know, and find find information on on that sort of stuff. Like I, I'm going to read more about that because I, I I'm not a, an engineer and I don't know much about these things. Hmm. Well, yeah, the problem is that that. No one tells you. You have to read between the lines to see see what it you know actually implies. It, one of the problems with it is is with a partial view you can make you can sell it quite easily because it's, it's easy to oversell the amount of control that, that we can expect to have. And so David Keith is very good at it. I mean he he he's been at it since you know a decade or more maybe 12 years now and he used to you can see on on youtube he used to basically just about be hissed off the stage of the mere mention of geoengineering now that doesn't happen anymore you can you can see more and more people are getting anxious enough that they're prepared to entertain that so yeah but the, the bigger thing is to just make people question the hubris of humanity managing everything down to even the weather and the, but there's another aspect to come come in on is that it's plan a for the economists so so these kids don't realize they think that well it's prudent to have something in our back pocket in case things don't go well and and you know basically we can't get emissions down what they don't realize is economists think it's plan a so the economist magazine so you know you can clearly see in the economist magazine that they really really want geoengineering because the way they see it is you know it completely nullifies all these crusties and their stupid tree hugging shit because you know once we control the weather that's it we're off to the races there's nothing we can't do we'll increase prosperity and we'll have this materialist paradise that they all want and so the the economists are the dangerous one and so you can you can also do some research on the the economists because what those guys are going to do is as soon as there's an engineering success you see that they all these kids and like xr and stuff they they say well you know we need to know it's better to have the knowledge and knowledge is formed and you know knowledge is never a bad thing and it's like no it is a bad thing knowledge is power and basically if you give these people power over the climate they're going to use it so the more research we do into geoengineering the closer we are to, to applying it and as soon as david keith and scopex and that actually does a successful trial the more successful trials they do the closer we get to some kind of nordhaus character getting a nobel prize for saying like well now that we have geoengineering it's proven science we need to deploy it and now we can take carbon up to any any amount it's just a question of how much uh, you know how much acidification of the oceans we're prepared to sustain but then do the do the economics 
Certific certification of the oceans will cost the fishing industry about 10 million a year. That's nothing. You're saving, you know, just having free reign on carbon and no carbon tax or anything or no restrictions on carbon emissions. That's worth thousand billion trillion gazillion to the economy. So yeah, forget the fishing industry, geoengineer our way out of it. And that's where we're headed. Does everybody understand why we shouldn't be doing geoengineering? Because I'm never really sure on this point. You can actually be talking about this and some people have been going, yeah, but what's wrong with that? I, I always make assumptions that people know why you shouldn't be doing this. But is anybody struggling with this concept of why you can't be, be doing this? Uh, well, one thing you said before was that once we start it, we can't stop. So once we stop, everything will be even worse than what we have now. So that's my one take of why we can't start it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's hubris to imagine that we can, uh, you know, maintain that without being distracted by wars or economic collapse. It, it basically, what you're doing if you do geoengineering to maintain the, a cool planet is that you've taken on that job and you cannot give it up even for a week. It, it, just a week would toast the planet. So that's real hubris because think of what it demands that if you have a big program say two billion a year for planes to actually see the upper atmosphere with sulfates if you um what that does is it if you just think of the logistics and what keeps the logistics flying, it means what keeps those planes in the air you have to have a steady supply of parts you need pilots those pilots need to be fed so it um and you need fuel uh, so just think how many components and how much complexity you've you've uh you've coupled this control of the global thermostat to to feed the pilots you need a stable food system it's the you kind of bread rights or something as a, a food security problem that that might mean that people are struggling for food in america or something and then you know uh, how do you know that the pilots are given priority and stuff that the pirate the pilots might you know might be killed in social unrest or something like that um so then you you think well the oil has to keep on coming so if there was ever supply shock uh, like there was in the 70s when you can't get gas at the pump there's no guarantee that they'll prioritize those planes to so sort of make sure they get the, the av gas to to fly those those missions they might say well the, there's some military strategic problem on the border that's more important and the guys that actually run that scenario might not know the climate science and know how important that is so so you see how dangerous it is to actually couple these things to all these other systems and it includes you know will the countries that actually spend those two billion always be financially stable enough to actually pay for that i mean what happens if we print ourselves into hyperinflation it turns out like the you know the french us in yacht and america has a fiscal collapse well they might not be able to afford to put it up now it's, it's not just america i mean imagine india is a very probable candidate for starting geoengineering they just they're close to wet bulb mass dials from wet bulb temperatures so the pressure on the Indian government, even the Bangladesh or Pakistani government, to actually start geoengineering when there's a mass die-off from a temperature extreme in India, there'll be tremendous pressure on, on po politicians to do it. Now, you can easily imagine Modi or something like that initiating uh, that kind of climate engineering in South Asia. Now, it means they can't blink. You see, just as they initiate that in a crisis, that crisis might turn into a fiscal crisis. They might have a revolution and the Indian Air Force uh, gets taken over and cannot fly. And then basically we're in real, real trouble. So, so you, once you start, it's not that you can't stop like an alcoholic, it's that you can't blink. It means that the alcoholic cannot not have a drink for a single day. 
it's much worse than, than just saying it's an escalation of commitment. But it is an escalation of commitment with the understanding that you can't blink. It's it's so <laughs> it's so batshit crazy. It, it's just beggars belief. But that is how shit batshit crazy we are. But but also some of the, some of the clinical our survival some, depends on backing off and stepping down. But some of the products that are going to be used for for uh, solar radiation, uh, bright, uh, solar, uh, how do you call it, um, solar radiation modification, and 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 for marine cloud brightening, like they have to be produced too. They have to be brought. They have to be, you know, it's not. They are all, uh, rather cheap most of the things that I use, but they still have to be processed. There's still, there's still a chemical um, industry behind that too. So that's another component. Like if there is a, a collapse of any kind, those, those things won't be, I mean, it's, it's like, look at the moment, there's some farms in America who are still waiting since the spring for their fertilizers that are produced in China and that they can't get because of the, the crisis with containers, you know? So, I mean, this is happening now. Yeah, this, oh, so this you yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, but can you imagine the hubris that says, oh, no, we'll always have a supply of sulfates. Like, what happens if no. you, know, you know how it's going to go down? They're going to award the contract to some, like, Rio Tinto or some place that has a monopoly. And then, basically, that, that company is going to go into bankruptcy or something, and then you won't be able to get it. And you say, well... Well, hey, we'll source it from somewhere else. Oh, no. Oh, we forgot. We gave away a monopoly to Rio Tinto. And you, you find there's no source while the military is running around trying to find where to get sulfates. I mean, sulfates are easy to get. It's basically rock. So it's basically just, you, you can just get concrete and, ch and crunch it up. But you see what um, David Keith and those guys are talking about is they're doing re res the research, and this is another reason why the research is dangerous. They're doing the research into finding out exactly what kind of particles you want to put on, I mean, and what they mean is what size and stuff. So you can see they're, they're thinking you're going to manufacture them especially for purpose. So they know that if you have uh, just the right size, you minimize the amount of uh, radiation blocking, you get the most albedo with the less, you know, kind of sky white and all, all of this but so you know but it's a trade-off so the bigger the particles the, le the less they stay up so that's why they're doing all the research to find out exactly the perfect particle but when they've got the perfect particle you know that it's going to be awarded to some scumbag like Elon Musk or, so, or Bill Gates or something like that because see Bill Gates is hot and holds his names on the patents and stuff and the reason the reason it's on because you can you see these guys know which way things are headed so you know damn well that you know before this goes too far bill gates will miraculously own the only sources of sulfates <laughs> you know that it's implied or they will find that well the sulfate precipita precipitates out and basically acidifies the ocean then you'll need some counteraction for the acidification of the ocean and bingo who owns the monopoly on that technology oh just happens to be old bill Always at the right place in the right time, but goodness, you're all for humanity, Bill. So anyway, Bill, you have the monopoly. So it's it's, it's like it's 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 so nutty from so many angles, and we sleepwalking into it. It's just unbelievable. And then I wanted to say the long-term consequences. We don't know what geoengineering is going to do. Uh, we've already seen damage to the to nature, but also to people. And then you're going to have more climate refugees. It just exasperate, exasper you know, makes the problem worse, potentially. Well, we know what solar radiation management does because volcanoes do it. It's basically just, you can just get volcanic ash and shove it up there. And that you're mimicking a volcano. But you see, if you look at um, a volcano, uh, like that, the one in Iceland that, that went off in like 2016 or something like that, that like it, it's not neutral <laughs> in any way. So, you know, there were a lot of flights that were grounded and things like that. So, you know, you, you might get a situation where an airline says, well, you know, we fly 37,000 feet and your crappy geoengineering is destroying our planes. 
then they can have a lawsuit and some judge in Poughkeepsie can rule that they have to stop geoengineering till they sort out the case. So it, it's that absurd. But, you know, the, it, it's, it's politically not neutral either because they, they've modeled it already and they know that they can increase the crop yields in America at the expense of China. <laughs> this is you tell me that some psychopath like Pompeo or something that isn't going to push for that is like, oh, screw China. We can hold them off with atomic weapons, but we can have better crops than them, and that'll increase the GDP. And all the economists will say, yeah, works out for us and Nordhaus. But and it, know, that'll cause global war. It's just. But do you know it's the same? I I find this there's a parallel with um with the the concept uh, the same concept for the human body in medicine the the not understanding that one thing that you intervene on completely affects everything like for example antibiotic cover i'm not saying antibiotics are bad i'm saying that in, and more and more we've seen people getting antibiotics for no reason or just because in case they get infected like that has that has been more and more an indication for prescription of antibiotics for doctors covering their ass not to be sued or all sorts of things all sorts of reasons you know using more antibiotics just and and, and there's some people for example i don't know i've seen people coming with a with a a, a dog a bite something you know and it, it, okay they can get a tetanus vaccine and they can clean the woman but a lot of doctors would not put them antibiotics but a lot would say oh well i better give you some in case you know not say we'll see you and that is just a tiny example but it's the same thing the same concept the the lack of understanding of interactions and complexities and how when you when you act on one biome you you touching the whole thing and you create an imbalance and it's the same reasoning in science that has gone completely insane insane <sighs> Yeah, and you either get it or you kind of don't. But it's exactly like you're saying with medicine. There's also this long chain of unforeseen consequences. So what happens in medicine, as you know, is like you go in for one thing, like, you know, blood pressure, and they give you Lipitor, and then that screws you up in some other way. Then they give you something for that, and that screws you up in another way. And eventually you're having, you know, 15 medi medications for all the complications and side effects that you got for your first problem. And overall, your health is worse than if you just hadn't started down this path. But that happens in ecology, that happens in medicine, that happens in, ge in the engineering. It, it's, it's what we've done. It's what the alien cortex does. It's trying to get control. And the more control it gets, the more unforeseen consequences there are. And but you see, economists say, this is not bad. It's like, that's extra jobs. We have extra jobs. You, you know, eventually we'll have full employment. You know, basically, when the climate goes wrong, that's a job opportunity. We'll have a new industry, which is fixing damage the geoengineering did to the climate. What's not to like? And basically, you know, we've already gone too far, but they don't accept it, and they're going to go further. But you, you see, that doctoring and engineering and controlling mindset is the alien cortex. So you, you always get back to the fact that it's killing us. It's killing us. But But... You know, it's it's defending itself. What it's it's you you have to get woo, woo and mystic after a while because the David Keith is an alien cortex defending itself, and and so he's not going to relinquish control. <laughs> he rather die, and, and so we are at war with our own alien cortex, and it's it's a war we've already lost because. Uh, you know, the damage that we've done, we, we're in overshoot. We, we, we passed the tipping points. So, you know, we're screwed. We're going <laughs> to gonna hit the wall at the speed of sound. And, um, yeah, the, even now people can't restrain themselves. So it, it would be better to hit the wall at like 50 miles an hour rather than 100 miles an hour. But we can't even do that. We can't even admit that we're going to hit the wall.
Well, I was reading a recent study um, well, in well. one of the universities uh, there in, in Ireland, and they, since in light of the of the scepticism towards the vaccine and all that, there was a whole bunch of psychologists, you know, study on uh, what, what's happening. Why are people not trusting science, medicine, and government anymore? And they've analyzed the, the data going back a few years, and there's, there is a rising uh, uh, percentage of people who are starting to to doubt uh, science and medicine and, and general, you know, powers to be. But the conclusion of the, uh, it was very interesting to read the analysis of the study by the professors who were doing it because themselves belong to that church, you know, and they were saying, this is a very worrying trend. Like people are starting not to trust doctors, not to trust science. And what can we do? Do you know, we're going to have to control this too, because this is a terrible thing. <laughs> so it's getting more and more complicated, you know. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so they've always done that. I've, I remember in the 90s reading, you know, new scientists and uh, nature and stuff. And scientists, even back then, they did a lot of hand wringing about why do scientists have such a bad rap? How do we get rid of this, you know, kind of Dr. Strange Love image and this mad scientist in a white coat? And you say, like, well, by not being that way? Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> no, we never thought of that. We want to be mad scientists, but we want a great press. We want to be, but in, in some ways they, they achieved it because all the geeks in Silicon Valley made geekism respectable because the geeks got to be billionaires. And then they were like, see, geek is cool. And then now we're stuck with geek is cool. And the, the scientists also get the spillover from that. So they used to be ridiculed as silly wonks, but but now it's like, well, silly wonks are billionaires. You know? <laughs> so it's like, oh damn, we ran up against the other cultural trope that you know, greed is good. So yeah, but they that that is our biggest strength as team human is is uh, that those those guys you know I, we we innately terrified by that. Kind of Klaus Schwab image and all this guys in white lab coats. It, it is terrifying. I mean, it's like even a dog in a vet knows that this is not a good place to be. But I, but I think <laughs> it's only terrifying. Put their tail between the legs. I think, I think honestly, when I look around, I mean, us, yes, our group, the people on our sub, and a few of our friends and people we're close to. But in general, in general, the majority of people are search reassurance from the white coats and all that. They're they're really looking up to them. Look at the uh, look at the the vaccine situation, for example. Like in my country, ninety percent of people took it with a big smile, and you know, and they're wearing a badge. I'm vaccinated. You know, oh my God, I've done something so good. I'm not saying that I'm you know I'm not advocating one thing or another. But what I mean is that they're they're really looking up to that. So I I don't think uh, I, it might be increasing the distrust, but honestly, in general. And even in the emerging, what you used to call the third world, and and you know the, the, these people are starting to look up to science and doctors and everything in a, in a, in an enormous way. Like it's just you know, I don't think there's any trend of 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 distrust apart from a few a few uh, labeled as mad as we are. Do you know? Uh, no, no, no. I think it's a growing. No, there's there's definitely a groundswell. So you know all the the anti-vaxxers and stuff like they that is a groundswell of distrust. That that's the right wing. It's of authoritarianism. Backed, yeah, but it's extremely backed yeah. by uh, extreme right. Yeah, the, 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 but you yeah, know, we're, we're uh, small, we've uh, we've got a. I was just going to say, where there's smoke, there's fire. So all these people that are, that we consider are conspiracy nuts, um, they are, there are really, like, you know, we've discussed this before, there really are conspiracies. So maybe their metaphors are extreme or over the top, but they can sense that something's not quite right, that there's a lot of things that are being lied about, suppressed. Um not revealed so so they go and have yeah they always say oh you're a conspiracy theorist but they're really a conspiracy so it's not a theory 
it's real. Yeah, you see, I think there's a very definite advantage we have, and that's that they haven't quite politicized uh, the transhumanist issue. So it's not really a left-right divide yet. But you see, it's it's much easier to convince the right wing that things like you know scientism and rationalism and stuff on are, are not cool. The the liberal left are really house slaves, and they're really you know educated and sold to the system. They've sold out to the system, so they are really hard sell. But in with within the the left, uh, the hippies predominate. So so the left needs to be divided vertically and what what we need to do with the with the slops is um to make sure that the you know it's transhumanists against team human because that's cross cutting that doesn't polarize it in left and right but there's only a, a limited amount of time to pull that off if if they get their way they'll be like you know they'll make it a left-wing divide and so it'll be you know left-wing people trust the scientists and so you know geoengineering is fine because the scientists say it's fine and then it'll be like oh you're one of these uh, right-wing conspiracy nuts that think you know geoengineering is all about harp and you know chemtrails and uh, you know read a book also and then uh, then it'll split down left and right wing and then we're fucked that if they can split it vertically, blue and red, then geoengineering will go ahead. So we have a limited amount of time to cut it horizontally and say it's, it's tree huggers against rocket scientists and lab coats. And if, if we do that, then we still have the majority. But split down the middle, it's 50-50 and it's deadlock. And, deadlock, and if, we, if they achieve deadlock, in the opposition, then they'll go ahead by default and do geoengineering. But yes, yes. I think it's, geoengineering. It's will, will, I think geoengineering. I think one of the big things geoengineering will, will win. One of the big reasons why it, will, it might win is fear. When when things go really bad, people will be there. Won't be any revolt. Anything. People will be. It will be bought. No. no. There'll be no other choice, and people will say, "Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, my, my, no, no, no." I, it's not what I want. Don't get no, me wrong. No, my gut feel is that, that this is the final straw. No, no, the, I, I really feel very strongly that this is the final straw. The, the transhumanists cannot do this. This, this is their final comeuppance, because, because everybody, you see, people will go with things like, you know green tech fixes and stuff like that that that's that's it doesn't affect i mean it's an affront to the sacred but if you're talking about geoengineering mother earth they, everybody knows that like come on dude you were just edging on the you know on on defiling the sacred but everybody knows you're a psychopath now that you see if if you cross, this is the final frontier. It's kind of like the last red line. If you're this stupid, then the game's off. Everybody's against you. And so so this will be their comeuppance. You see, the scientists have done well out of the fear ticket because they it, it, all that's at stake is you shove government subsidies at them and stuff like that. But nobody likes scientists, <laughs> right? And basically, they they the villains in movies apart from like you know yeah well like in jurassic park and that but the, the most uh, scientists can aspire to in the popular culture is you know the scientist who gives the warning that the politicians ignore but but in general if you're looking for a villain it's got to be dr monroe or it's got to be you know dr strange love or or so so everybody's innately hostile to the alien cortex but this is the crown jewels. So, so, so this one isn't going to be the same. This is, this is where, you know, basically, this is Hamlet, right? This is, this is where Scar goes too far <laughs> in The Lion King. But this, this is definitely the final hurdle. 
So, so this is this is why I think, you know, we win. But, but, you know, it's it's close run. <laughs> yeah. And you see, the, the, it could get to the stage where they do it unilaterally. So, so where one of the scenarios that can happen is there's so many crises going on, kind of like daily, like now, that that they they can do it under the cover of uh, all the other crises. So, in other words, if there's a war, they they'll be able to do it. There's nothing you can do during a war to counter. So, so I believe we're heading for war. So we only have a limited amount of time before we can actually, you know, discredit this. But, but I believe so strongly about this that if if we can prevent uh, geoengineering, we could probably prevent them going to war, since it's to so tightly bound <laughs> to what their war planning must be. That that's a very interesting link to to sell to. A lot of movements who are pacifists and anti-war, this sort of um, optic of uh, if you want to be anti-war, you know, oppose geoengineering because that would find. That's why I think we win. You, you, that, that's a, yeah, that's a very good argument. You, but you get the whole CND crowd. Everybody, everybody will say this is a step too far. You see, because it's it's military technology. <laughs> and so, in other words, they're flying under a lie, and and so all our task is is to expose the lie. It's it's not that huge <laughs> task, but you see, imagine if uh, say XR, if we could turn XR around, and so that they'd say like, okay, we're going to boycott COP. And because it's too late, and it's too late for CO2, we passed the tipping points. The IPCC is full of shit. And so then you say, we're on to the next game. And the next game is to stop people trying to geoengineering us out of this disaster. Now, there's still room, a lot of room. Imagine if people like did a rebellion against geoengineering in the streets. That's a little bit hard for people like David Keith and that to talk their way out of. See, they, they're flying under stealth. Uh, they, they're doing this stuff in secret, and they're lying. They're misrepresenting what they're doing. So they're very, very vulnerable. Right. Well, wouldn't but, it be really interesting? You see, they'll, they'll spin a little web. Wouldn't it be really interesting to get somebody else than Claire and Roger, but somebody who's quite uh, important in XR, who's and have him have a conversation with us about this subject. Something, somebody that would be, because we I haven't, get the, the, you know, I don't know people in XR. I mean, I'm sure there's people here who probably uh, know some. I don't, I don't, I know a couple in Ireland, but they're just really farmers. And no, they no, just, one, one step at a time. Hmm. No, one step at a time. I mean, first of all, XR is, is a, a flat organization and it's a free for all and everybody has a voice and it's just a noisy room. So mm -hmm. the first the first step is to get over that. <laughs> Once the if you can get to the stage where the organization has proper leadership, then then you can establish, you know, now you have to shut up and listen to the boss. When you get to that, then you can influence the boss to start telling people what they need to do. See the see as it is now is People say, you know, if this is not suiting me and it's not nonviolent and it doesn't have a guilt in invitation and it doesn't come with flowers and it doesn't fit with my LGBTQ leanings and if it isn't about animal rebellion, then I'm not in. And the organization goes, oh, no, no, please don't leave. <laughs> and you need to get other things that you're saying like, really? Fuck off. <laughs> and then people will stop leaving. If, if people know that, like, you want to leave? Fuck off. Well, well, people stop that threat of leaving. In fact, they stop leaving. If you have this threat to say, if you want to leave, fuck off, we don't need you, you'll suddenly find that no one leaves. Yeah. Because, but what they want is a strong organization. And so they're undermining themselves by being democratic and nice and stuff. It's it, every, see, 
everything about XI is conflicted. It's the same old letter. It's all, um, you know, decision bound, conflicted, morality bound. It's it's just the circle of logic um, that's completely uh, undermines itself. And so you can't get through that while you keep it a big collective and you be inclusive. So this that XI has to go through is they need to cleanse their mindset. It doesn't even really matter what mindset they come up with in the end of it. But, but you need to uh, cleanse yourself of all these conflicts, these cognitive dissonances in the organization. So it, it's riddled with contradictions. I mean, the people themselves have contradictions right down to their last brain cell. You can see in these guys who, who talk in, the, in this two weeks of rebellion, that in one paragraph, they will have such a stew of contradictions and, you know, logical impossibilities and just fucking nut shit. Um, and in, in one paragraph, even sometimes in one sentence, you'll have these oxymorons and truisms and it's just, it's just a stew. So, so the very first thing is to just basically get their thinking aligned so that they're pointing in one direction. And, the, and so w once you do that, then, then you can start steering them around. But wh while the cats are all in every point of the compass, uh, you can't actually get the movement going anywhere. And that's, that's what they're finding. Eventually, the cats just wander <laughs> off in different directions because there's no center. And th that's, so the first thing is to, to get a center. And that's, that's, I think, what we're all working on currently. And if you go and have a look at the post, that I just put on uh, Extinction Rebellion now, just before this call, you'll, you'll see that's the first proposal that, that, that I make. And I, I expect it's going to shock a lot of people. But, but, the, but so, so please come in and start brigading it. Because, you see, everybody knows me now. <laughs> and I need backup. <laughs> because they, they start to know where I'm coming from. But something is... Is very interesting is happening on on the sub, and that, that's um, I, I'm wearing people down. You see, I, I come up against these people again and again, and they're starting to shut up. <laughs> I, you know, I thought that the, for a while there, I thought they just have bottomless shit, and you'll never change people. But but uh, I'm learning that that. You, you can wear them down, you know, the, you, you just come out again, again and again against the same bullshit and you wear it down and wear it down and, and eventually they stop arguing. They, they really stop arguing. So, so you actually start to win the argument. It's, it's dreadfully hard going. It's a real slog. And, but I thought really that it's kind of unwinnable that these people are, you can't fix stupid. But you can make stupid shut the fuck up. And that's what you really need to, you know, align all the molecules, <laughs> align all the bar magnets in the same direction. Is you, you just need the fucking contrary idiots to shut the fuck up. If you don't need consensus thinking. You just just need the opposition thinking to climb up. And it's it's possible. I mean, I I I don't think I convinced anybody. I never turned anybody around, but I got them to shut up because they realized the the arguments were untenable. How many members but in it? It's, it's very funny. Some people have actually come back and they well, there's 60,000 or something on the mailing list. There are 20,000 people in on X on the sub on Extinction Rebellion sub. Hmm. But but is all in the all, main, they could probably count 100,000. Is that the main there. online platform they use, you think? Or are they active on other other media, or like their website, or and their I don't know social media like no, Facebook, no Facebook, no Facebook, Facebook and YouTube um, is much more active. So their website, Facebook and YouTube is much more active. But you see what what I like about um, about Reddit is that the thoughtful people go there. So you can't. I don't even bother with things like Facebook because you can't advance an argument. It's like Twitter. It's just too sound biting. And so, but you see, the people, that it seems to me, I hope I'm not you know, fooling myself, but 
I think the people on Reddit, they actually are thoughtful and they're kind of intellectual. So, you see, you don't have to convince the whole organization. You just have to plant a seed and, and let it grow in some of the people. So if, if, if say, like one in 10 people hang, hangs out on um, the Extinction Rebellion sub, if you can change the mindset on just that one forum, it will bleed into other forums. And it, it's likely to do it in a, in a good way. It's likely to do it in a way that, say, the leadership and all the guys, all the trolls and all the guys who've infiltrated and on, on behalf of the state and all these guys who have nonviolent agendas and basically people that are corrupt, they won't know where it's coming from. They'll, they'll just see these ideas bubbling up from somewhere. And then they, you know, they won't be able to counter them very easily. A very, you see, eventually you get to the stage where they have to address the issue. As soon as they start addressing it, you've kind of won. But it, it's very valuable to actually get the mainstream leadership or the the thought center or the thought leaders and stuff, and to drip feed these ideas so that they don't know where they're coming from. So I think I think I like. Extinction Rebellion Reddit sub because I think it fits the bill from for that. And so yeah, thank I'm, you, thank you. Yes, I, I, I was like I'm advancing the conversation. Yeah, that's that's very clarifying because I I I I, I agree with you about the, the the uselessness of Twitter and Facebook for many other reasons, but for for XR particularly, I think if there is twenty thousand on the sub. Well, registered and and the sixty thousand on the mailing list that that means a lot. Like you know, and even though there might not be a lot posting, but there might be a lot reading it. And yeah. And anyway, they probably they link to a lot of their YouTube. Content. Yeah, there are a lot of people reading it. Yeah, yeah and they, they link to a lot of their YouTube co content, and I think that they seem to be uploading on YouTube quite a lot. So it might be a good idea too that when when we comment on a on a YouTube uh, on the next uh, YouTube one that you cross post on us so that we go to the YouTube and put some comments under the XR uh, videos because I noticed that there's not that many views on YouTube they, they're not really you know this it's not enormous so I don't know if people read the comments on YouTube but I think it might be worth even repeating the same comment that you put on Reddit to put it on on YouTube too even though it's a bit strenuous and well, time consuming but uh, I think it might be a good idea that everybody but kind every, of just comments and no, but continuous repetition. Continuous rep repetition is important because you see, from the leader's point of view, is they say, you know, oh, you know, we we're hearing and the troops out there that blah de blah. People are beginning to say blah de blah, and they don't realize it's it's us. <laughs> Just a small group that's shouting rather loudly in a corner. So, so you don't want to stand at the podium and start shouting your head. No, you want to be so in. If you stand a good deal away and shout loud, that basically the message can propagate to the podium. You, no, you, you want to be like a, yeah. See what I mean? You want to be like an infection. <laughs> Or an infestation. Yeah, you, you basically you want to agitate the web from the edge. Yeah, you 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 want to make the web tremble from from the edge, right? But the uh, I I think it's it's kind of working. I mean, ha have a look at the post that I did. I got like a hundred and eight upvotes on the on the last thing, basically saying that <laughs> Exxon needs a root and branch reform. <laughs> <laughs> and so some of the old gods, like Zeno Arrow and stuff, uh, say made a few weak objections, saying, "Oh, you just, you know, I did that poll as well." And some of them made the weaker objections, saying, "Like, oh, it's just the way you worded that poll and stuff." But I laid it on. You see, you see, when they make of those objections, you've got to follow up and find more arguments. So, so I followed up and. Back them up by YouGov poll and back them up by what the Guardian said and stuff. So it's really starting to weigh on all these arguments. And the ones you want to weigh on in against is these shibboleths that you keep on getting. They're, they're, they're all these little mantras and conversation stoppers, and that's part of cult behavior. It's a cult. Right? So, so 
uh, to undermine the cult, uh, you need to question the the articles of faith, and you need to question all their shibboleths and all their mantras. So, so you get these mantras, like for example, violence doesn't solve everything. It doesn't solve anything, and it's like bullshit. Violent got rid of apartheid. Violence got rid of Hitler. Violence just basically ousted America from Afghanistan. You're talking shit. Fuck off. <laughs> and then it's like, whoa, nobody's ever said that. We we all just go, you know, we do we all say violence doesn't solve everything. And everybody goes, Om Shanti, you're so right. And then like that's against the rules. You're not allowed to stand up in the cult and say, hang on, this article is bullshit. Is there like People are freaked out. So they start trying to defend all the stuff. And in the defense of it, they unravel because it's completely indefensible. You see, most of the articles of faith are lies. It's exactly like this thing about nonviolence. So they have they put nonviolence first, then they have all these rational arguments to support it. And basically all of them are bogus. But you you know, nobody questions them. So the thing is to question them. And then they have to think up a new defense. And then you question that. And after a while, they run out of them and shut up. Then then after a while, they don't, you know, with me, they've learned not to come up with this Gandhi shit and stuff like that because they know oh, I shoot it down so badly and, and ridicule them and bully them and stuff like that. So, so they stop doing that. Now the only people I get are people that don't know me. And they come and do it again. And then I just pummel them again. But they, they start to disappear because people know, they know, quite, they, they know that they aren't uh, hiding to nothing doing that. But what it means is that, you know, that's the end of that little piece of lie. That's a bullshit little, little atom of nonsense in the cult. And so you break those atoms down one by one by one. And then what's left is, is the, the egregore. Of, of the new cult, and that's that's how you, you change them. But that's the way you change them this way, way is to just get the boss to tell them <laughs> the new party line and then they have to, have to change. But we, we're not there yet. We're still getting to the stage where they have to accept they even need a boss. Well, anyway, so is is that enough for this evening, or did we have any other topics to discuss? Did anybody have any questions or objections to what I'm saying? I guess the only thing I want to ask is uh, any updates on uh, what's going to happen in the next coming, you know, with uh, faulty XR and the whole plan in uh, October, right? And uh, Ramsey, Ramsey. Oh, so so the, so the, the what what's agreed on is is that we we will do what I'm doing now on um, on Reddit, and and that's to to basically not let them get away with. Um, yeah, this was a huge success, you know. Yeah, we raised awareness. You know, there's another one bullshit thing. It's like we raised awareness and everybody goes, hurrah, awareness. And he's saying, like, guys, stop this shit. Awareness does not correlate with a reduction in CO2. You can raise awareness to any level you like. It's not coupled to ecological destruction and CO2. So stop saying we raised awareness like that actually means anything. Awareness does not result in any kind of effective solution for the environment. So, so stop that shit. And that's very new thinking for them. This is part of the deeper psychology of liberal left and individualism that opinions count and you know my opinion is important and all of our opinions together make you know make for change and stuff and you say no they don't your opinion means fuck all what what you believe no one gives a shit you don't matter you're just some turd of one eight billion turds on this planet to stop getting so self-important and so so 
that's the truth of it. They think that, well, we can change people's minds. It's like changing people's minds doesn't keep the fucking carbon in the ground. Especially Exxon is still there taking carbon out of the ground. So it's, don't come with this shit. So a lot of the stuff is not letting them uh, get get away away with, with fooling themselves. And that's that's our task now. Now, the next one is, is COP26. So what they said in all their planning on these two weeks was, you know, after that, we'll come out of the two weeks. This is literally what Samar said, one of their planners. He said, the government will be reeling after those two weeks. <laughs> well, they're reeling, they're reeling with laughter. But I don't think anybody even told Boris Johnson that they were on the streets of London. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't know. So, so anyway, the government is not reeling. Uh, and so then they said, and then from that, we'll go straight into COP. All roads lead to COP, and that's where it really matters. It's like COP is a copper. COP was started by the oil industry to prevent change. So it still has that legacy. They will, COP is there to basically window dress the lack of change. So if you go to COP, you're endorsing it. You basically, they need the activists to be there at COP. If they don't have the activists, there, you're doing activism as normal against, you know, business as usual, then basically something will look wrong. They have to window dress it so that the cop looks just like the same old shit, nothing new, 26 and the line, you know, it's, it's, it's normalcy that they, it's a, an, an image of normalcy they're trying to create. So, so by going to cop, you're reinforcing that normalcy. If, if no one turned up at COP and they had a boycott COP, people go, what? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's like, we're the protesters. Well, that's a hiccup. That's a serious visual flaw. That's a bit of optics that the COP can't afford to have. So the COP needs you down there protesting. And so, but these guys are not smart enough to figure that out. So they're liable to go to COP. But what... What we need to say is start a campaign for boycott COP and make these arguments for why you don't want to go to COP. They will go to COP, but what we want is, is, the, is the high ground to say, you know, you went to COP, you're an idiot. Look, see, all you did was endorse them. They, they didn't do anything. See, what Rupert Reed said in, in, during these two weeks, Rupert Reed is big on COP. He, he likes all the Davos and COP. <laughs> he likes to hang out with his pals and protest them. But but the the what he said was, well, it's obvious that in COP26, they're going to come and say, you know, basically do some outrageous foobar about, you know, just utter, utterly incredible... Um, you know, just, just just stuff that's embarrassingly inadequate for the climate change and stuff, and outrageous. And he says, and then we swing into action because, you know, we 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 all go nuts uh, about the outrage of this, the outcome of this last COP. Well, that isn't going to happen. There are not enough people. And Exxon itself has whittled down too much, and they're not... <coughs> <laughs> Fridays for Future and all the other groups, they're not enough people that care about enough about the outcome of COP to suddenly do a massive rebellion in the wake of it. It's not a spark to, to you know, spark an insurrection or whatever they think they're doing. So from our point of view, we need to tell them not to do this and afterwards, after COP, see, tell them, yeah, we told you so. So the, the idea is to discredit the, the current techniques so that basically they're worn out. And the, the current guard is, is, you know, <coughs> the hive and all these guys that currently are steering them, that basically they, they will have to lose control because they're becoming so ineffective. So that's the next thing is, is COP. Then, then what will happen in, in October um, is that then the hardcore guys will come and do mass arrests. So basically 160, somewhere between 160 and 300 people will be arrested continually for <laughs> four weeks. Holy shit. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, you know, 
if you i mean <laughs> i'm laughing because it's just so i don't know how this is going to turn out man but i think the way it's going to turn out is that that the police are gonna you know even before the police crimes bill i don't think the police crimes bill will be out there and they might push it out really fast if, if they think it's going to you know, be really disruptive. But it, what what they're likely to do is to stop doing arrest and release. And I think they'll just sh chuck all the people involved in, in jail and hold them on remand. And so so that the, the two weeks will end rather sadly. I mean, the four weeks will end rather, rather sadly, I think. But but anyway, the, the strategy is, the greed strategy is that, that the new tactics of you know hardcore hit him where it hurts uh, mass arrests um and none of this pussyfooting around with glue ons and banner drops and larping is it like that that will be discredited and we'll start this new hardcore thing so so yeah so then at the end of that the 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 closing ceremony of that that we designed is is the first kind of fun thing that's more like an, an arg. So the first introduction people will get to this new way of, um, you know, kind of humorous way and, um, you know, basically centralized control and single leadership. So, um, so yeah, so in, in the meantime, then that plan will go forward, but in the, um, in the, the short term, then, is um, just designing, um, yeah, what happens after COP, <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, and then um, what happens after that November rebellion. So, uh, so yeah, so then um, uh, yeah, have I left anything out? Um, yeah, the the other two things are the the recruitment thing, which uh, Sophie was looking into, and that was talking to, um, you know, to these institutions, trying to find more radical kids, and then, um, yeah, Chris Hedges and other personalities, and and getting them involved in that, but start to design recruitment and how a recruitment meeting works. But one one of the things that I if if they'll go for it, I think would be powerful. It is a little controversial. Is is using those kamikaze headbands, so that any anybody that was an arrestable would wear a kamikaze headband and would become kind of like a, a kamikaze pilot or samurai, you know, kind of headband of honor. And then you would go to say recruitment meetings, and you would have a like ten of those guys that would give, do witnessing and stuff. And, wear those headbands and you have to earn them so that that's that's something and then there was the the russell brand thing and that was frustrating because, because oh, yeah. i happen to know somebody who knows russell brand as a personal friend and and she wouldn't ask she wouldn't ask russell brand if he would do that you know xr shaman role and uh, I didn't want to delve too deeply because she said, well, I got the impression that she knew him personally, but <laughs> they were on a rocky footing. <laughs> so she kind of said that she would do our case worse than <laughs> if, we, if we just approached him anyway. But yeah. So anyway, that's 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 the roundup of the, the plan so far. So hopefully they'll get back and they haven't completely gone cold now after this you know impossible rebellion two weeks how about um faulty's um connections do you think he has connections to russell in any way i i don't know if he has connections but i presume he does yeah Yeah, that could be worth uh, exploring. Um, yeah. I don't know how else to reach out to Russ. Russ. Yeah. Wait, uh, you were quite soft there. I missed that. Oh, no, I was saying um, 
I wouldn't know how else to reach Russell except through through Faulty's connections, yeah. Yeah, so this contact of mine said that, yeah, you should just, just try on his YouTube videos and stuff because he, he, he does respond. He said he's not that famous a figure, apparently, that, you know, he doesn't talk to anybody. But, but I think the main thing is to just, I don't, I don't know whether people like this idea of a shaman. I, I think it's freaking marvelous, but, but like, um, I'm not sure that, that uh, everybody will get it. So that's the first thing is to establish that that's, that's going to work. Oh, I mean, um, I, I like the idea. It, it has that, uh, the mirror of the, of what happened in the U S and it can be seen as a, as a joke, a parody, some people won't know what to think. So I can see it working, but, and the reactions will vary, which is what we want, right? We don't want, I mean, it, yeah. It's, it's powerful, it's, it's perfect slaps. So if, if you can't see the value of it, I would say you can't see the value of slaps because it's, it's, just you know it's basically operation mindfuck that's what slaps is so it's basically it's it's a complete mindfuck to have a <laughs> you know, it's not a shame it's like <laughs> it's it's just no, no one knows how to take that you, you know it's big it's big enough to like make headlines in the sun and stuff but you know it's like what the hell do you do with that information <laughs> that just like blows your mind and that, that's the whole point I think it's wonderful, but oh man, it'd be so cool if it if you can pull it off. Yeah, I mean, but, how would we yeah. introduce the idea anyway. to to Russell if anyone had? I mean, would you like to be uh the UK shaman? It's yeah, it's hard to. Yeah, no, yeah. I <laughs> no, I just imagine that Forty would call him up saying we, we're doing this this massive action in October, and and we just thought it would be an act absolute rise it would be just hysterical if you got dressed up as the you know like the QAnon shaman and pranced around the, for a day or so so we could get a few pictures and get you in the newspaper and i'm sure it would appeal to you know russell brand's sense of juvenile mischief <laughs> yeah i i think it would be an easy sell actually so, yeah. But let's let's see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm I'm trying to finish this document that's trying that explains um, from the user perspective what it's it's like in the in the ARG and stuff. So then maybe we can give that to Jeff Hull and those guys and say, look, this is this is what we're trying to do. Oh yeah, that sounds that sounds good. Yeah, we would uh, we would need to give them more. I mean, if we don't have a budget as they've asked, then we we would need more uh, substance in our yeah and the idea probably. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. Is we need more substance to the idea, and we need something so that you can show it to people. You know, instead of pitching it to them. So it's, it's kind of like the long form brochure, the long form business plan without figures and stuff in it. We, we, you just put forward the mission, you know, and so people can see. But um, we, we, we're getting close to the stage where, I, you know, I'd also like to put it on kind of um, Extinction Rebellion and stuff, but we, we're getting close to the stage where people, people are already saying, you know, like, okay, if you're such a clever dick, then what should we do now? <laughs> you say, well, that's a good place to get to. <laughs> but um, we need, I've, I've done lots of things about what to do next, but I haven't pulled them all together into, into one nice place. But if I put something like that out there and, um, you know, and let people tear it apart, 
then it would help for us to start arguing that this is the way to do it. Because people will pour scorn on it. Because it's new, right? They're, and so we have to convince them that, yeah, we have to go up the old and start on the new. And it, it's, it'll be divisive, right? So, you know, at least, at least half the organization is going to be lost in, in this change. But there's not much left of it. Right. And, um, yeah, we, it's important to get the ones who are I guess, serious and who want to do something. Uh, you know, time is, you know, we're running out of time, <laughs> as people say. Yeah, so, but the, a lot of people out there, you can see just in the upvotes and that, the, the, a lot of people want to do something new. So, so I think there'll be a lot of people that will say this, this, this will work or it's worth a shot or, you know. The, the thing is that Exxon needs to experiment. And this is, this is one experiment. Um, they're not doing any, any experimentation worth a damn. I mean, we need grassroots fundamental reinvention of classic tactics. The classic tactics have ended. So it's it's a monumental task to just, you know, upgrade them for the surveillance state and e-tyranny and Allison's dystopia. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but, you know, I, I would like to start on, start developing it on, on Extinction Rebellion sub and Booting people off that are just you know obstructive. That sounds like a plan. So, yeah. Well, please join me on some of those things. <laughs> so we can brigade yeah. it. Yeah, I've already uh, done. Like I know Sophie's done a few posts, and then I've helped her reply to a few people. So I yeah, I I've, I've been uh, yeah pushing more on the. Um, geoengineering how it's yeah how, all the pitfalls and you yeah, have come across people who who are in support and I'm, yeah I've, I've been trying to look for uh, research and i'm glad I, I came up upon that video with dane so yeah i'm just collecting things on yeah the gen geoengineering side of it. did you see that pdf that i had with the, the big bad fix Oh um, no! I ha I'll have to check that out. Did, was is it on? Um, so did you post it on XR Mid or? It's I will, I'll post it here because it's yeah I did once but but it's it's so good that I'll I'll post it again here. But this oh, great. this this says it pretty much all. Um, and so if you if you uh, um. So, here, yeah, I'll post it in the chat here. So, but, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. check this out. Thank you. So, yeah, every, I think every, all of us should read that document. It's a, it's a book. But, but that book really lays it out. Absolutely bang on. I, I, I keep on posting it. Whenever I mention geoengineering, I'll post a, a link to, to that. But you can see the guys don't want to read it. Most, most people respond in under a minute. You know, you know they haven't even looked at it. All right. But I urge I urge everybody to to read that one. All right. Great. Thank well, we covered you. some ground today. So. All right. Well, let's take it out then on that note and just um, pause. And I, no, I must tell you something. I I uh, just before we go, just just an anecdote. I'm, sure. I'm actually in in the island which I wrote the book about. And George, the key figure in my book, is, is around here. But anyway, we went to George's restaurant last night with somebody that I've interviewed a, a few times on my YouTube uh, channel. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, you're sitting there having a kind of Duma conversation, and is there are like six English people in the next table, quite far away, like two meters away. The tables are two meters separate, and we're having this kind of Duma conversation, and this guy comes up, one of these six people, he come, comes up and uh, he says, do you mind um, turning it down or changing the subject? Uh, we're just trying to relax here and the subject is really stressing us out. <laughs> and I swear that I had a look and these guys, they, they six people, they're not even talking to each other. They're all sitting with iPads. They're, at, they're fucking having dinner. And they're sitting with iPads, all swishing like this. And I saw that there was one woman. She was looking at me dead in the eye. She had a face like a freaking gargoyle. And, and she, she hated the Duma conversation. She just hated it. And she was looking daggers at me. And she went to her husband and, then, nah, 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 and made him get up and come and, uh, come and ask us to shut up. But I just thought, isn't that incredible that basically we're having a, a – a normal Duma conversation about the end of the world, and it, and people are so sensitive now that they they and so that they're stressing us out talking about it. It's it just I don't know. I just had to share it with you because it's such a picture of denial, especially in the place where I wrote my book. <laughs> Is it basically these, these people are are you know swiping on their screens, and it's like don't want to hear about Doom. We we hear. We're here on a holiday to stress, you know, de-stress and like, you know, and, and my feelings are so important and you're stressing me out. You need to change your conversation. And it's like, it just, just epitomized to me where, we're, where English people in particular are, are at. So just wanted to show it with you. Anyway, on that note, um, let's uh, just pause and end it there. Thanks, everyone. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you for your help. Thanks. Bye. Take care in the week. Take Bye. Care.